Well, I'm glad that the service has gotten started and we were able to overcome the fire alarm. For those of you who were just walking in the doors and the alarm went off for you, uh, that wasn't a sign that you were noticed. It just means that uh, somebody did something that caused the alarms to go and we had to evacuate. And uh, so I'm glad we're able to, to come back in and have this time together. So thank you, thank you. I just wanted to uh, start out by, by saying uh, we haven't had an opportunity to express to you the, the gratitude that, that we uh, have toward you as a congregation, as our pastoral staff, who uh, you, we receive from you expressions of love and uh, during uh, October, which is Pastor's Appreciation Month. And uh, aren't you glad to get that over with? <laughs> I would appreciate pastors in that one month. No, that's a joke. Come on, people, laugh. It's just, it's all right. It's all right. And, uh, but we, we felt overwhelmed and we felt uh, very, very loved. And uh, that, that the, the love offerings that were given were just distributed to the staff. And uh, they have uh, received just those expressions of love and it was encouragement. So thank you, thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. It's not going to be a surprise to her now because I surprised her fully in the first service. But I'd like to call Debbie Lober and her husband Lane up here. And um, you want to just like, um, you may not know what you're clapping for, but go ahead and clap, all right? Right now, right. That's great. So... Um, De Debbie has uh, served uh, on, on staff with us here for 18 years, and uh, she re she, her last day was last Thursday, and uh, so she's here today at my request because I'm going to have her share uh, in a part of the service a little later, but I also wanted to, for us to be able to express our gratitude uh, to her for her years of serving and the selfless way in which she has, uh, has, has given of her time and uh, the way she's grown and and the way that we have just uh, progressed together. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you that you just uh, leaned in to this responsibility. You saw your responsibility shift over, over the years, most recently in the area, really uh, in a big way of guest services, which I think a lot of people have been affected by your uh, teaching us hospitality and things like that. So we just want to tell you, Debbie Lober, thank you very much. And we just express our appreciation to you. Thank you. Just take it. Just take it. <laughs> oh yeah, it's good. So we're really gonna we're really gonna miss her. We're gonna. Oh, by the way, this is Lane, her husband. Just re remain standing, okay? Remain standing. Please remain standing. So this is Lane, all right? So, yeah. So um, Lane, Lane has had to put up with a lot. I don't, I don't mean in her, but with the job. Both. Well, maybe both. But uh, in, in the job and all. And uh, he's a school teacher and is going to be uh, wrapping up this year at, at his school. Um, 30 years teaching at that one school. That's amazing. Wow. And, um, and Debbie's going to be uh, moving uh, to Idaho um, next week. And then Lane's going to be around here, so they're going to have a long-distance relationship, right, for a little while, so you can pray for Lane uh, during that period of time. And oh, and her, too. <laughs> um, and uh, we're, we're going to uh, get to see him a little bit. But I'd like for us to bless them, okay? So if you, if you feel comfortable with this, I'd like to invite you just put your hand forward like you're blessing, like you're speaking blessing. And I'm just going to say a blessing over them, okay? So, Father, thank you so much for the Lovers. Thank you for Lane and Debbie for all that you've done in their lives and that you will continue to do. We bless you, Debbie and Lane, with the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you with fullness of joy in your new season and your new adventures. We give praise to God because he has plans for you. And the plans that he has for you will cause you to flourish, to experience more of him and greater and deeper things even from one another for your extended family. We bless you in this new season of ministry, how God will use your life to in fact <laughs> affect others. <laughs> that was a bad mistake right there. To affect others with the beautiful work of Jesus in your life. And we ask you, oh God, that you would just gather them up in protection and provision and may your great peace rest upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And here, I'll give this to you so you can keep it this time. <laughs> right? All right. That's good.
Well, it's really good. It's, it's just good that, man, when people give of themselves and serve, and, and thank you to, to all. Um, we, will, we will say, as, uh, as people are kind of, you know, kind of charged with uh, leading things, if, you're, if you've ever been charged with leading something, you are so grateful for people who have willing hearts to come along with you, people who have willing hearts to say yes, people who, who just show up to, to the ministries and learn and grow. It's just that part of this is absolutely spectacular. And so I know that she feels that way toward the many, many uh, volunteers uh, who have served with her over these years. So we are talking about yes, 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 yes at Christmas. Um, we do live in a, in a, in a no culture. I think you do know what I'm talking about. We live in a culture that tends to tell us that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we're not rich enough, um, that we're not savvy enough, that we don't have the tools. We're, we're constantly being told, even through uh, advertisements, that, that we don't quite have enough. We experience drive-by shamings. We experience voices in our head coming from our own wounded selves or voices from the evil one who takes opportunity over those experiences of the past and even voices from significant people around us reminding us about how we have fallen short. So we experience a, a no much of the time within our culture and we're constantly trying to deserve a yes and that is an uphill battle because you know that someone can say yes to you 15 times and someone can say no at a significant place in your life and you remember mostly the no and yet at advent in the celebration of Christmas, we are being reminded that we have a God who intrinsically is a God of yes to us. A God of grace, a God of forgiveness, a God of new beginnings, a God of hope, a God of light and love, a God who loves to deposit within our lives something different than the story that we've been living out. In fact, the story of Jesus is intended to intersect with our stories in such a way that it actually changes the narrative of our own particular, our individual lives. It can change the narrative of our marriage. It can change the narrative of our family. It's so important that we learn the yes, that we hear the yes. In fact, we introduced this whole series by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where it says this, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Or as one translation puts it, whatever God has promised gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. In him, is what, in him this is what we preach and pray. God's yes and our yes together, gloriously evident. So when you look at, at the yes, it's just the yes of God, which is the initiating yes, right? Nobody, try, nobody has to convince God to say yes. God is a yes God. He's, he's, he's for humanity. He loves human beings. He loves people, right? He loves for things to be healed. He loves for things to be working together for the good. He, he just loves to deposit his truth and his hope and his light and his love within our lives. So he's a yes God. And when the yes of God meets our yes, then, then that, that begins to create a relationship with God. No, re no relationship begins if one person says yes and another person says no, right? The relationships come about. Actual, the coming together of this relationship is when God's yes is met by our yes. God's promise met by our belief in that promise. Our willingness to embrace the promise, no matter what is happening. 
And so we saw that this, this great revelation, the stunning revelation, in John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, the voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. And we have seen him enveloped in undeniable splendor, the one true son of the Father, evidenced in the perfect balance of grace and truth. So the word became flesh. The voice became flesh. So Jesus, Son of God, took on flesh. I mean, this is like the bold, crazy, mysterious proclamation of the good news that we have to share with the whole world. So to quote, the great promise of God fulfilled at Christmas is this. God had seen the misery of the world and had come himself in order to help. He came not as a mighty one, but in the obscurity of humanity where there is sinfulness and weakness and wretchedness and misery in this world. And that is where God goes. And there he lets himself be found by everyone. And this proclamation moves throughout the world anew, year after year after year, again this year. Also, this news comes to us in another Advent and celebration of the Christmas festival. Light thrives in the depths of darkness, blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot, it will not be quenched. This is the yes of God, right? Have you ever thought about this? That God is more interested in you than he is in himself. Were that not true, he would, he would not give of himself like he did in giving his only son. He's not interested in just protecting himself, right? He takes his, his holiness, he takes his awesomeness, he takes his glory, and he embeds it in humanity. And then that humanity, seen in Jesus, goes all the way to the darkest, deepest, most hidden, most obscure, most messed up places. The voice of God, the yes of God, the Jesus of God finds his way into our own brokenness. And it's like amazing, this love gift, right? That we are the focused attention of this love, the love gift of his son, Jesus. And God knows that only when he has our hearts, only when he has rescued us from that darkness, can we ever experience this meaning of life. And yet, and yet, much of the time, even though God has said yes, much of the time we feel like we're still waiting to see the yes. So like I can, I can say to you, God has said yes. God has given his son. But I know that the personal experience of many of your lives is that you're still waiting to see the yes. Waiting for the yes of God. To kind of like come home to you in a personal way that lifts you and heals you. So the text for today is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. I'm going to read from uh, a voice translation, a, a, a different translation than most of you probably have. It's included in the YouVersion app, and, and I've just copied it over there since it's not in YouVersion either. But uh, you can... You, you may follow along or just listen to these words. So it's Mary and Joseph, right? The, they have the baby Jesus. He's eight days old. They're taking him to the temple, and they have this encounter uh, at the temple uh, as they take Jesus for his dedication. So while fulfilling these sacred obligations at the temple, they encountered a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was a just and pious man, anticipating the liberation of Israel from her troubles. He was a man in touch with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's liberating king. The Spirit had led him to the temple that day. And there he saw the child Jesus in the arms of his parents, who were fulfilling their sacred obligations. Simeon took Jesus into his arms and blessed to God. Now, Lord and King, you can let me, your humble servant, die in peace. You promised me that I would see with my own eyes what I'm seeing now. Your liberation raised up 
in the presence of all peoples. He is a light who reveals your message to other nations. And he is the shining glory of your covenant people, Israel. His father and mother were stunned to hear Simeon say these things. Simeon went on to bless them both. And to Mary in particular, he gave predictions. Listen, this child will make many in Israel rise and fall. He will be a significant person whom many will oppose. In the end, he will lay bare the secret thoughts of many hearts, and the sword will pierce even your own soul, Mary. God's word today. This, this story. As I read this, I, I just think about the whole issue of, uh, of hope deferred. He was a man waiting. And you know, when you're waiting for the yes... And you're hearing the no. And maybe you're not hearing a no, but you hear a wait and a wait and a wait and a wait and a wait. <laughs> you can really feel disappointed, can't you? You may remember that a couple of weeks ago. I, I just uh, read to you something I'd entered into my journal on uh, uh, one morning as I was reflecting just upon my own life and all. You know how hard life can be, right? I mean, you know, you know how disappointing circumstances can be, how disappointing people can be, how disappointing, uh, you know, um, how disappointing uh, circumstances may be, you know, how, how disappointing God can be. <laughs> I mean, you can feel that, right? I mean, you, you know what that is like? I mean, I think we all have experienced it to some point. And I, I had written these words that there are enough disappointments to make skeptics of us all. There are enough promises from God to make faithful followers of us all. And I just think, that's, that's so true. I was just thinking, there, there's enough disappointments. If I focused on the disappointments in my life, I could easily conclude, what's the use, right? What's the hope? I mean, why, you know, like we say, why keep beating your head against the wall, right? You may have troubles and difficulties and disappointments that come. And really, the whole, there's whole swaths of people around us who have decided to settle in the direction of all the disappointments. And we become skeptical. And we become cynics. You know? We see a child having faith and a child enjoying something, you know. And, and we think secretly inside, yeah, I'll wait till you grow up. Right? We see someone with a dream, and we've had our dream smashed, and we say, yeah, right, well, I, you know, I'll try to be here when your dream collapses, you know. And sometimes we rain on the parade of other people's lives, even before they've had the chance to express themselves hardly, all because we're learning how to be skeptics and cynics. There are enough disappointments to make that of us all, but here's the good news. There's a, there are enough promises of God to make faithful followers of us all. God's promises stamped yes in Jesus. And the fact is, you and I, we have this uh, choice. We can decide to live on the, on the uh, uh, you know, kind of in the narrative of disappointment, or we can choose to live with our lives as they are, live into the narrative of promise and the yes of God. And I will tell you, the choice that you make at that point leads, they, it leads in two very opposite directions. Thankfully, at any time, living in the land of disappointment, that you hear the yes of God and begin to respond with your yes, to begin to actually embrace the premise and to believe what God has said more than believing your own experience, the moment you do that, things can begin to dramatically change. The yes, the yes of God, so it's not easy, right, this waiting. Like, what are you waiting for? Just think now mentally. Uh, let your mind go. What are you waiting for, right? You're waiting, waiting for a better job, waiting, waiting for a relationship to work out, waiting for someone to, like, come around, you know, waiting, waiting for an affirmation, waiting for an answer to prayer, waiting for a healing of your body, waiting for, you know, finances to work out, waiting for uh, just... You know, just any, I'm just waiting for this to be over. Sometimes we don't have anything in particular that we say we're waiting for. We just say, I just want it to be over, right? This time of stress and distress. What are you waiting for? 
And the question is, are you waiting in hope? Or are you waiting hopelessly? There's a way to wait in hope. And there's a way that we often wait, which is marked by hopelessness. When hope is deferred, here's the good news. When hope is deferred, the yes of God teaches us to never give up and to never quit believing because God is a God who has come into the mess, into our need. Amen. Do you believe that? Yeah. So I want to invite Debbie, would you come? Uh, I've asked her uh, to come and share a, a bit of her story. And uh, many of you have heard uh, maybe the whole story, although I doubt if there are, well, maybe not many of you have, but some of you had. But we were in a small uh, meeting uh, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, and we were kind of talking together about each of us saying, well, what is God presently doing in your life? And as we just went around the, the, the four of us, um, I just was struck by what you shared. And so thank you for being willing to tell just a bit of your own, your own story. Yeah. So the picture um, on the screen is a place that I lived in 26 years ago. It's off of Fifth. You probably have driven by it in the past or even right now. And um, <clears throat> that was a place where I was very hopeless. I had um, walked away from the Lord many years before that and was living out the consequences of that. Um, my past had involved um, sexual abuse for many years. It, uh, I got pregnant, then married, wrong order, right? And then divorced by 21. So by the age of 26, I had felt like I had bumped into so many walls. I was so frustrated with God because I kept feeling like, how come I can't get any further? How come I can't get anything? It just felt like I'd make two steps forward and four steps back, and I just couldn't understand why everything I wanted that I thought would make my life better was just out of my grasp. And finally, at age 26, I had just been so hopeless and I was so despondent that my father, I was a single mom living there. My dad had given me a gun for protection. And I walked into my bedroom in fury at God and was going to end my life because I was just realizing that there was no hope. My little son, who was just six years old at the time, I felt like he would be better off without me. I was no good influence. And at that moment of desperation, Jesus took me in his arms, whispered that he loved me and gave me hope. Now, I can't tell you that at that moment, like, so everybody knows I'm a Disney fan. It wasn't just happily ever after in that moment. It's not like the sitcom where everything wraps up in 30 minutes, but I knew I had a hope. And I knew what I had been searching for in situations and in people and in relationships was not hope. I always felt like if I had that, I would be happy. If I had that, it would bring me joy. But I realized that hope is a person Hope is Jesus Christ. And when your hope is there, your hope in everything else will be fulfilled. Or if not, there's still that peace, there's still that joy inside. And so then I came to this church, met wonderful people. I was able to meet a wonderful husband. And even that, you know, you kind of, I always would have felt like, oh, if I just met the right man, it's going to be great. And it has been great. But he is not my hope. Jesus is still my hope. He has helped me through a lot of healing. I've had to go through a lot of different things as I've healed through the different situations and as we have continued to walk. But like Dave said, as Jesus has given me an invitation into yes, I have said yes back. And most of the time, not having any idea what that yes is going to look like. And to tell you that I could never have imagined my life now. I mean, my dreams back then that I thought was going to be so fulfilling are so small, depending on now uh, saying what God has given me. That... Uh, this um, picture just means so much because um, a few weeks ago we were driving by that and it just was a huge revelation to me of where my life is now. Um, we had heard from one of our friends that their nephew, who was 19 years old, committed suicide the day after Thanksgiving. And every time I hear those stories, my heart just breaks because I so know the hopelessness of where they are and I so understand where they were. But I realize now that I would have missed out on so much if I would have listened to what the world had to say to me and not listened to God's yes, I would have missed out on a wonderful marriage, on children, on grandchildren, on healing, on hopefuls, on many relationships that I've had over the years. All of that would have been gone because of that. 
And now I realize that I, that was 26 years that I thought was hopeless, and now I've had another 26 years, so now you know how old I am, um, of <laughs> 27 years, of amazing, amazing things, and I know that there's even more. And so I'm just so glad that I said yes. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And before we clap, yeah. just a second, and, and mm -hmm. she and I talked about this, before we clap for God, <laughs> not for Debbie, before we clap for God, I just, I, it's so like symbolic that in this little apartment complex uh, next to Meeker Elementary School, across the street uh, from uh, Spark Stadium, where she as a 26 year old struggled with whether or not to continue to live. Somewhere along the line, the place was called Grace Abounds. In front of the apartment that I lived in. In front of the apartment. <laughs> that she lived in. That scripture in the New Testament that says, where sin abounded, grace now much more abounds through Jesus Christ. So no matter, one of the carols that we will sing is his blessing flows as far as the curse is found. And so the whole picture is that name where the curse goes, go as far as it has gone, and there you will find the yes of God waiting to do something new and powerful. The other verse that comes to me that I didn't say first service is that, that the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten right. and that has been so amazing so over these 26 true. years. Yeah. So now let's give praise to God, shall we? He's amazing. He's amazing. He is. He is. In the name of Jesus, I speak freedom to you to hear the yes of God. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to know that in your dark place, the light of Jesus has arrived. And the light is stronger than the darkness. I bless even the hint of faith within you. And I bless where you perceive no faith at all. That you will awaken to the reality that this amazing God has arrived. He has arrived. And things will not remain the same as we say yes to him. had several just little texts that have come across my way in the last week even about these issues. One woman texted me this, all of us are waiting on something, often wondering if God has forgotten us. In your waiting, let the birth of Christ encourage you. This very minute, he is working for his glory. He is working toward your good. Though circumstances say otherwise, God is going to come through on schedule, fulfilling his long-appointed plans for you. Don't give up before the time is right. In other words, don't give up, right? One of the things that we had talked about that spurred me inviting Debbie to share is because in that time around the table, and you may have heard her say this, but in that small group a few weeks ago, she just said, look at all I would have had missed. Right? If I had not heard God's yes. If I'd ended it there. Look at all that. And that is just the thing. Right? It's just God, there's so much. There is so much ahead. Even if it may come with still trial and still suffering and still a lot of healing. Sometimes we're like, like you know, the, the healing is, is like birthing. Right? It's like it doesn't always just come instantly and voila, you know. All the great voices that sing in angelic choir, sometimes it's just like in travail, but the healing is happening. Uh, we have friends, uh, many of you are friends of Scott and Liz Davies. And uh, Scott and Liz took their family, their three boys, to Disneyland they, uh, this week. And right when they got to Disneyland, uh, Joy, uh, their son, uh, came down with appendicitis. Ain't that great? 
It, are, it happened to us with our four-year-old, our grandson when he was four years old. We all went to Disneyland. Uh, oh, he was six. Thank you, Lynette. She keeps me on six, right? I always look to her. When she goes like this, I know the sermon is over. But anyway. <laughs> but, but he was like six years old. He, so we spent our time, and he spent his time uh, in the hospital with surgery. So Joey had surgery, and it, he was, it was all really infected. It was not good, but things are now good. And, but that was a hard time uh, for the family. And, and we're a part, his dad and, and uh, me and some other men are part of just kind of this men's group, uh, group life. And we share prayer requests. And, and one of the really f freshly renewed followers of Christ, uh, he, he, he texts back these words. And I thought, this is like, oh, my goodness, this is so good. So when you heard that it worked out, then uh, he texts these words. Congratulations, buddy. I told you I would pray for God's best decision in this matter, and I didn't think about how many variables God uses through every single situation. He protected your son. He steadied the hand of the surgeon. He humbled you. He connected Christians together. He brought smiles and warm opportunities to fellowship, reasons to be thankful, opportunities to pray, and wow, that is just unreal to me how much our Father can do inside a single dilemma. Praise to Abba. Praise to our God. Isn't that awesome? How many? I just love that last phrase. How many things the Father can do inside a single dilemma. See, this whole matter, like we're waiting and, and it's difficult to wait. It would just be so well to, to read after people who've had to wait, to know the stories of those who wait. We just need other stories coming in to the story of waiting, don't we? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you've heard me speak of him at 39 years of age as a Lutheran pastor, German Lutheran pastor. He was put to death by the Gestapo under Hitler as Hitler was making his one final rage of executing those who had opposed him. Um, he wrote letters from prison. He, we have many of his earlier letters, too, and messages. Fifteen years earlier, before he was executed, 15 years earlier, he had written these words, and it's like it could be written today, right? We all come with different personal feelings to the Christmas festival. One comes with pure joy as he looks forward to this day of rejoicing, of friendships renewed, and of love. Others look for a moment of peace under the Christmas tree, peace from the pressures of daily work. Others, again, approach Christmas with great apprehension. It will be no festival of joy for them. Personal sorrow is, painfully, is painful, especially on this day, for those whom loneliness is deepened at Christmas time. And despite it all, Christmas still comes. Whether we wish it or not, whether we are sure or not, we must hear the words once again. Christ, the Savior, is here. The world that Christ comes to save is our fallen world and our lost world, none other. When I thought those are, those are bold and good words. I wonder what he would write 15 years later. I wonder how circumstances would change his fundamental hopefulness. And so, kind of within months before his execution, he manages to smuggle out a letter to uh, his dear friends. And this, these are his words. The world lives by the blessing of God and of the righteousness of God and thus has a future. Blessing means laying one's hands on something and saying, despite everything, you belong to God. This is what we do with the world that inflicts such suffering on us. We do not abandon it. We do not repudiate it. We do not despise or condemn it. Instead, we call it back to God. We give it hope. We lay our hand on it and say, may God's blessing come upon you. May God renew you. Be blessed, world created by God you who belong to your, your creator and redeemer. Oh, man, that's just like, are you kidding me? That's just like such powerful hope in the midst of his incarceration, of having been cut off from normal communications, even from his family and his young fiance. He says, 
what do we do during this time? We say to this world around us, laying our hands upon us, we bless you. You belong to God. It's incredible. We learn a lot, really, from Simeon, who here in this, in this uh, passage of Scripture, hears the yes of God, but in the middle of the wait. And so, in a way, he shows us kind of how to wait while not yet seeing the yes. And then what to do when we see the yes. The whole text kind of begins with Luke saying, and look, you know, they were going to the temple, and Luke uses a word. It's kind of toned down in some of the translations, but Luke uses a word that would cause the reader to say, and behold, like, and look, pay attention to this. There was a man. They ran into this old man at the temple. It's almost like, don't let this pass you by. So he uses that, that literary uh, technique. And, and a word that's used often in the gospel message of Christ to be translated, behold, like, right? Behold, this man. They meet this man. And we notice about this man that he was a man in touch with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's anointed. The Spirit had led him to the temple that day, and there he saw the child Jesus. So I, I see in the midst of the yes of God, there was a man in waiting. And what this man in waiting was learning to do, this man in waiting was learning to say yes to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was... Before he was ever really fully active in a way that we understand now, after the resurrection of Jesus and the giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, the Holy Spirit rested in particular on certain people here and there. And Simeon was one of those people. And it says that, that he, he was in touch with the Holy Spirit. And he had been formed, informed by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's salvation. And it, he, I'm not sure he knew exactly what that was. And then one day, he was led by the Spirit to the temple. And there he saw the baby Jesus coming. And instantly, just like that, just like that, it just came together for him. He took the baby from the arms of his parents, Mary and Joseph, and he looked at the baby and he said, this is it. I can die now. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had an experience that says, okay, I can die. <laughs> this is like the apex of all experiences. This is the ultimate, right? Oh, I can die now. And, and, but that's how he felt. He knew he, knew he was seeing the, the ultimate, the ultimate for him, but also for the whole world. It says that he was a righteous and devout man, which means that he was paying attention to the things of God, that he had a lively relationship with God, that, that he had an attitude and a posture of reverence toward God. He was deferring his life into the, to God. He was paying attention to all he understood, and he was waiting in prayerful expectation for the consolation of Israel. Oh, there's so much to say here. I just, I just want to... I just want to say these things that you can carry with you. The consolation of Israel is not like a consolation prize. You know, like, hey, you came in second. Way to go. Not that consolation, but consolation as in comfort. And the word here is waiting for the comfort uh, of Israel, the consolation of Israel, the help of Israel. It, it's a word that, on the one hand, it means cry. A call out and a cry out. And on the other hand, it's the cry that is met by God's comfort. So in one word, Luke just captures what is going on here. The cry of, of Israel, the cry of the people, broken and oppressed, under imperial rule by Rome. The, the, the pathways outside of Jerusalem, the street, you know, the, the roadways were lined, you know, in some places with crosses where crucifixions had happened. That was a form of execution every, ever before Jesus was executed there. And he said, this is the consolation. He was waiting for the consolation, and this is it. The ruins are crying out. And the ruins are being met now in this Jesus. He saw it. He saw it. He took the child in his arms. And he blessed the Lord. In fact, just let me read this. God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation it's now out in the open for everyone to see a God revealing light to the non-Jewish nations and of glory for your people Israel. 
I love that part. With my own eyes, I've seen. So the question really is, have you seen? Have, have, have you seen him? Do, have you looked at him? Oh, my goodness, we talk about church, and we talk about doctrine, and we talk about theology, and we talk about politics, and we talk about what's right to believe, what's wrong to believe, you know. And there's all kinds of stuff going on. And we just fail to look at Jesus. Just look at him. Just look at him. So I, I was reading, um, read the story, and I, I just thought it was like so powerful. I wanted to, sh to share it with you. It's an old Jewish tale called The Fugitive and the Rabbi. One day, a young fugitive trying to hide himself from the enemy entered a small village. The people were kind to him and offered him a place to stay. But when the soldiers who sought the fugitive asked where he was hiding, everyone became very fearful. The soldiers threatened to burn the village and kill every person in it unless the young man was handed over to them before dawn. The people went to the rabbi and asked him what to do. Torn between handing over the boy to the enemy and having his people killed, the rabbi withdrew to his room and read his Bible hoping to find an answer before dawn. In the early morning, his eyes fell on these words, quote, it is better that one man dies than that the whole people be lost. Then the rabbi closed the Bible, called the soldiers, and told them where the boy was hidden. And after the soldiers led the fugitive away to be killed, there was a feast in the village because the rabbi had saved the lives of the people. But the rabbi did not celebrate Overcome with a deep sadness, he remained in his room. And that night, an angel came to him and asked, What have you done? He said, I handed over the fugitive to the enemy. The angel said, But don't you know that you have handed over the Messiah? How could I know? The rabbi replied anxiously. The angel then said, If instead of reading your Bible, you had visited this young man just once, and looked into his eyes, you would have known. My own heart grew quiet in the reading of that. Realizing how many times I hear the yes, or I, you know, I'm distracted, distracted by stuff, <laughs> offended, discouraged. And all God ever really needs from us is just take the baby out of the arms of Mary and Joseph and hold the child and look into his eyes. Maybe this week, maybe you would do that. Maybe you would pretend. Maybe you would imagine. Maybe, maybe you would imagine yourself to be Simeon or later the story of Anna and you would just take, you would just, just walk through this. Just imagine yourself Set, give it five minutes. <laughs> it may take longer, actually, but take the baby from the arms of Mary and Joseph and hold the baby in your own arms and look into his eyes. And I believe that the Holy Spirit who overshadowed Mary and impregnated her with the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit who led Simeon to the temple will be the same Holy Spirit who awakens your heart to God's yes. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much but we have to tell you, we sometimes don't hear the yes. We're distracted or we're offended or we're discouraged. 
or we don't have hope. I don't know how the miracle is going to happen for each of us this season, but I pray it would. I pray that if we feel like we are smart with regard to the things of the Bible, that we would just put that down and look at the baby, look at your eyes, look at this one, upon whose shoulders the whole weight of the world will land. If we feel like we are ignorant and not smart enough, too messed up, I pray that we would put aside our own evaluations and look at what you say. The word became flesh. and May we hold you. May we look at you in the eyes. And may a yes stir up in us. A yes to you. Thank you, Father. So in a moment, I was going to invite you to stand. And as we do, we're going to just sing the song. It's, it's a new song, perhaps, to most of you. But the words are just absolutely perfect. But as, as we sing this, if, if you... Look, <laughs> you got to move. Something in your heart or in your body or in, you know, in your mind, something's got to move or we will remain forever paralyzed toward this great gift from God. So I just, I just want to invite you. you. You may not know. Debbie didn't know. We all don't know all that the yes will mean, where it all will lead. We just know that the yes of God is better than both the no's and the yeses of our world. And so I just want to invite you that feel free as we sing just to step forward by that just saying I'm saying yes I'm saying yes I mean this is an invitation to actually say yes right so I'm inviting you to do it just to step forward and though there'll, there'll be some people up here that'd be happy to meet you meet you and pray with you if you wish but uh, why not respond God's yes meeting our yes right this liberating truth this liberating king come let's stand feel free I just welcome you if you feel the nudge, the, the urging of the Holy Spirit upon you, any, any indication at all that you feel like inside you want to come, then pay attention because that is very likely the Holy Spirit of God drawing you.